Hello everyone. Good evening. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. I am Ritesh Malik, marketing manager for Mindre India. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. So as COVID-19 is rapidly evolving and spreading globally, we think it is Mindre's honor and responsibility as well to establish a platform for all the international communication to happen among clinical experts from different countries. to better fight against covid-19 today it is our great honor to have two panelists sharing their keynote speeches with us firstly dr jiang peng our guest speaker from china as introduced by my colleague fiona he is a professor of critical care medicine and anesthesia director of icu of zhongnan university at uni Uh, Wuhan University, Zhongnan Hospital at Wuhan University. Dr. Pong has been fighting COVID-19, handling this extraordinarily challenging situation in the past four months, right at the epicenter of the pandemic. That's China. With great efforts from the frontline clinicians, including Dr. Pong, China has now seen a large decrease of new cases. Now, welcome, Dr. Pong. Hi, hello. Uh, hello. Hello. So, Dr. Pong is electing chairman of the critical medicine branch of Hubei Medical Association. Is a member of Society of Critical Care Medicine of USA since two thousand seven. He is a member of American Thoracic Society since two thousand six. He is a member of European Society of Anesthesiologists since two thousand two. He is VP of Hubei Province. Chinese Society of Critical Care Medicine he is the general secretary for critical care of Chinese Society of Anesthesiology as well he is the board of editorial member for journal of critical care usa his areas of special interest include critical care and anesthesiology he has more than 30 years of experience in healthcare now he has written abundantly around publications of more than 100 he has achieved an award which is star research achievement award awarded to him by society of critical care medicine under us mentorship he also received an annual award from society of critical care medicine usa in 2009 he has received the prestigious harry m wars research award by aspen usa and he has also been awarded the national excellent science books first prize award by china 1996 welcome welcome professor bong also Hi. along with our friend from china we have very esteemed dr murli dhar joshi with us i take this opportunity and privilege to introduce dr murli dhar joshi who is the national president of indian society of anesthesiologists in india which is a society of strong 37000 plus anesthesiologists as members in it also he is the governing council member of world federation of societies of anesthesiologists for the past 4 years now ongoing during this covid time especially in india dr joshi is actively taking part in formulating the sops work guidelines protocols and various directives for world federation and isa welcome dr murlidhar joshi thank you thank you yeah so dr murlidhar joshi is the head of department of anesthesia and pain medicine also he is the director of pain management center at virinchi hospitals hyderabad which is in india as i said he is the national president of indian society of anesthesiologists in india he is the gc member of wfsa he is a member of wfsa pain relief committee for the past 4 years as well he is the ex board member of asian and australasian regional section of wfsa he is a ex sub editor of pain section atotw in 2015 he was a part of wfsa in this regard he is the honorary secretary of indian society for study of pain issp he is the honorary treasurer of isa he is the reviewer for various national and international journals as well 
Dr. Murlidhar Joshi, areas of special interest include pain education and interventional pain management. He has total experience of over 25 years in healthcare now, glorious 25 years. He is the author of six books, many articles, some books which include fiction as well. He has been instrumental for the first Android application development on interventional pain management. He is the first to start fellowship in pain management in India. He is the first to author a textbook of pain management in India. He is the first to start e-learning in pain management in India. He is one of the highest awards is the academic excellence in 2010 by the prestigious body of IS India. Uh, so now I request Dr. Joshi and Dr. Pong to discuss among themselves regarding the topics of their concern and next phase i have a few questions prepared i will be asking them one by one and at the last we will have the audience questions okay so okay. over to dr peng and dr joshi for the discussion please okay yeah peng yeah nice, nice seeing you and a lot of uh, hard work from your side at uh, ohan congratulations let me put it uh, before even is express anything at this stage Thank you. Uh, when actually, I had uh, discussed with a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, in India. The what was being asked is, uh, how did they manage the such a flow of patients at your place? Did it come like like in about uh, like three patients, four patients per day? Did it come like 30, 40 per day, or 100, 200 per day? That's what they're they like they appreciate the effort that has gone through it. How how did you manage this kind of great task? Okay, so uh, sorry, I, uh, I I cannot hear you clearly. So would you mind repeat? Oh yeah, I think this is the maximum I can speak probably. <laughs> okay, uh, so Dr. Peng and Dr. Joshi probably I can intervene in between. Yeah, please, please. Yes, yes. So uh, Peng, the question is about patient inflow. Yes. Uh, Dr. Joshi is inquiring, yes. how did China manage patient inflow of such high volume? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is the very good question. So, uh, so actually, uh, we uh, run the uh, screen test uh, for the, you know, for the uh, COVID-19 for all the patients, uh, whether or not they are uh, elective cases or they are emergency cases, we, we run the, you know, the test, including the PCR, including the serology test, and uh, we will uh, try age, but we are try age these patients based on the results. So if the patients uh, was was considered as the COVID nineteen, and then we will uh, move these patients to the specific buildings. If the patients is still waiting for the results, and we will uh, put the patients in the in the buffer area. And uh, to also waiting for the results, and if the patients were now considered as the long COVID, and we just uh, labeled it, this patient as, as normal cases. So based on the, the results, and of course we need to run all the uh, screen tests for the for all the patients. Yeah, the next one I just want to ask: How many beds really they had in that? Uh... TBI province you know, to take care of that huge load, that's not a small thing because subsequently they constructed the, the hospital and all in 10 days, that's a different story. Can you ask that one? Yes. So Dr. Pong, uh, yes. we heard that uh, many new beds were added and some cabin hospitals came up in Hubei province. How many exactly beds were required for such cabin setups, such hospitals? Uh, you mean during the outbreak or now? Uh, during the outbreak, when yes, it yes, all started. Yes. yes. Oh, during the outbreak. So actually, is the we have uh, one uh, specific hospital, which is called uh, Infectious Disease Hospital, uh, open only for the you know for the COVID nineteen in the early stage, uh, which is around only one thousand medical beds. But uh, unfortunately, 
was not enough for the you know for the patients for the COVID nineteen patients in the early stage. So we have we had to open other hospital, uh, especially for the teaching hospital, you know, to to take all to take all the uh, COVID nineteen patients. So actually, we almost we almost opened to around two uh, twenty uh, thousand medical uh, beds uh, from our uh, from our the from the you know the general hospitals totally, and this is only for the for the patients which is called uh, hospitalized patients. Also, we have we opened you know the temporary hospital uh, for the mild cases just. Uh, you know, just to follow up the patients we, because we cannot uh, quarantine the patients at home. It, you know, because the you know in China, the uh, you know the apartment is quite small. We have low enough space, you know, for the patients to uh, the home quarantine. So we opened the temporary hospital, such as the uh, theater, such as the you know the sports center. Uh, uh, for the you know for this kind of the mild cases, just the follow up, just the, let them uh, just 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 the not allow them uh, uh, you know affect the other other uh, uh, populations. So around about uh, for this kind of the uh, temporary hospital, almost uh, around uh, ten thousand or two, ten thousand to the fifteen thousand. Uh, temporary hospital medical beds in the early state in the during the uh, outbreak. What, what, one last question from my side. One last question from my side. Yeah. I heard your press statement yesterday. Let me repeat. I heard your press statement yesterday mm -hmm. from Wuhan province. Mm -hmm. I mean, so Hubei province. About the recurrence of patients, and think you had some group, and they wanted to, uh, like you know, do the screening test for uh, almost, I should say, uh, one point one million, something like that. Uh, yes, yes. And yes. you said it is uh, very costly; it may not be practicable. That's what I heard. Correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. Yes, yes, because the we just no. Uh, one, I, I'm I'm not at all. One more thing I want to know is, were the new were the patients same as the previous patients, or are the new? So you know, actually, we uh, we found uh, uh, I think we found six new cases just uh, in the last two days. You know, so this uh, because all these cases, new cases, uh, were mild mild cases. So we we, we are still in uh, uh, tracking. You know, the you know the people uh, probably they have which have the close contact with with these new cases. So uh, from this uh, point, so the government uh, finally uh, make, make the, uh, the decision to run all the screen tests, uh, you know, in, in, in this city. So uh, to, just one by one, just one by one. So first, uh, do the screen test for the high risk uh, of the population, such as the, such as the you know, uh, the population, uh, you know, from the from, from you know the medical staffs or the you know uh, the family of the the family of the the family members of the hospital uh, hospital staffs the family members of the patients also the you know um, or, or any other uh, uh, or, or any other population uh, uh, which uh, you know, they have the uh, close contact, you know, with the potential uh, COVID patients. So just the one by one, just the step step by step. So first uh, for the high risk uh, population. So then uh, the government want to run all to run all the screen tests for the whole for the whole city. No, so we have done more than more than 12 million population in, in Wuhan. Yeah, Dr. Peng, only one question is, are the new cases what you have heard as some so-called positive, are they the old patients who became positive or the new categories? Uh, new, the new patients, are they the old patients who are, got reactivated or no, is it the... Actually, actually, all the new cases 
they you know they have a mild they have they are well mild no any severe symptoms just the uh, you know just the uh, quarantine in the hospital you know, you know for the follow-up in the you know in the in the in the in the hospital with uh you know which is called the jinyin Tang hospital this hospital is uh, specifically for the infectious disease patients sounds good thank you so much thank thank yeah okay thank you so dr peng if you have any questions for dr joshi Yes. and india yeah. specific yes okay okay thank you uh, dr joshi for your uh, uh, excellent talk thank so you dr actually i'm i'm also uh, concerned you know probably uh, after the the covid 19 uh, outbreak or everything will be changed you know in our, not only in our routine uh, practice but also from our, our but from our routine social life so so do you do you have a uh, uh, any experience you know in your hospital so how do you uh, try age your your patients uh, daily so such as the because we have for example if you have the emergency cases how do you uh, try age this patient is covid or non covid So you uh, and how do you uh, make the decision? So how do you put the the different uh, you know patients in the different uh, facility or in the different building in the different work? Thank you, Dr. Pang, for uh, information and uh, thanks for uh, your like you know the excellent lecture. And also, like you know, we learned a lot from what uh, you went through at Wuhan. Actually, in fact. Uh, What we are observing, like difficulties, what you faced, and also that was say you are you are you are for the first exposure. Like yes. in Wuhan was hit pretty badly. Let let me put it. It it could be me. It could be you. It could be you know the panelists who are sitting here. And and you handled it to the best of your capacity and you know, your understanding of the illness. What was happening? Nobody knew what was hitting whom, why. So with all those things, we are not now the the question strategy. What to be uh, followed how the hospital is. Uh, don't ignore any any complaints because at that time when probably at uh, this was about four months back the uh, thing was uh, like we thought it could be predominantly aerosol kind of thing at that time I don't know but that's what we heard from the initial uh, like you know, uh, inputs what we got and all it could be aerosol kind of thing like you know from the uh, whatever the like you know, there was a lot of discussion from where it came and all those things and back to human human and all those things initially it was projected like a aerosol. Subsequently, they said that like you know the virus are found in uh, even uh, probably the the GI thing also. Then they said the peritoneal fluid also. Then somebody said CSF also. Then 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 it become like it can come from so many places. Doesn't it respiratory pathogen? It was projected like respiratory pathogen, but it it not so now what any patient who comes and probably we look at it because the you know incubation period they said one to fourteen days. So technically, most of people they know about it because, uh, like India, is still in under lockdown. Like we don't have, a, you know, we do not have a full population who has come out of the whole lockdown, come into the main circulation. But still, we are watching uh, what are the variations which are there. And probably one thing we did not get much information from uh, Wuhan. The other thing is uh, two groups actually: children, children, we kids. We did not know how much they are presenting at Wuhan. And uh, pregnant women, difficult. I'm not expecting that we wanted to know from there, but uh, predominantly it was more like aerosol kind of thing. So people took precaution. Now what we do is we look at the poly who has showed symptoms and all those things. Taking biggest problem is the is the limitation of getting the testing kits, testing kits. And suddenly somebody and false negative is almost thirty percent. That's what we say. RT PCR. If false negative is thirty percent, then uh, we have to look at if somebody negative today. Because past two three days from now, how do you take it from there? So still we are we are still we are. I would like to say the long term phase we are coming out on door. Actually now the we are looking at uh, like easing of the thing and the problem the kids are more. These four months, Paul, I should say like you know the classical from uh, Chinese saying the bamboo tree doesn't grow tall initially. First four months it puts it develops only its roots into the soil. Subsequently the the tree grows. So first four months, India was doing same thing. Allowed the roots to go in deeply with all the experience. 
now we are looking at it can present different ways and all we take it we respect the way it comes and uh, what i look at is at this point of time is treat everybody as suspect covid so, so there is nothing like stigma kind of thing about that one like treat suspect covid and it can present in diverse way educate the people and take it about and it it's not like you know it's not like pathognomy compared to hiv hpc like lifelong stigma and all those things you just have tied over the case. that's why i asked you the question about the new patients what you had at for uh, south korea and with china uh, is was it a recurrent second wave or was it new group of patients because i said one more thing from uh, uh, china that i i don't know maybe you can correct me maybe i'm wrong when you had the first batch uh, maybe early maybe in, i don't know october november something like that and uh, this all for what we read from the the whatsapp knowledge it could be wrong 99% is wrong 1% and i will apparently the virus was injected into some monkeys monkey same virus same virus what we got human got affected it might be wrong but the thought seems to be good and after 14 days maybe some of them they died some of them survived who survived after 14 days one more inoculation was given but this time they had a very mild after 14 days one more inoculation was given and also idea of asking was whether the patients who got reactivation so, so secondary way what you got was it with new patient or old patient was if new patients they got it then we have to look them at a new group if it old patient who got it in case they showed mild symptoms that means there something called herd immunity which might be developing i am wrong you can correct me dr pang your uh, thoughts sir uh, dr joshi i think uh, dr peng yes will continue there was a specific question triage yeah. uh, how are we going to adopt in emergency the triage specifically that yeah, tri- yeah, yeah triage point of view it all it all depends what we are following in india right now like now we are also almost now for example uh, india recorded its first case in uh, i think it's on january 30th first case we got then 30 we went to lockdown around march 24th you can say almost two months of the first case and all but uh, like what a patient comes and all like one we got community surveillance also in which are patient we have like specific covid hospitals uh, once the lockdown announced all the elective surgeries all the hospitals were closed only some hospital directed only as covid positive covid hospitals and all the patient was streamlined to that covid hospital only so they were doing the trial with respect to depending on symptoms and all those things because the kits were limited we couldn't expose the entire ho- country for the ex- like you know, whatever the tests and all those things every city every town had a kind of a covid hospital all the patients were sent to that particular place and irrespective of whatever the complaints they had they suspicion of fever respiratory infection and subsequently by them we could get different symptoms like gi and also or probably primary contact secondary contact everybody was screened 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 and all the surveillance and then they were kept under observation and as per the merit of their complaints and all they were put on only observation or observation with with oxygen supplementation or with probably with ventilation and all so at the end of all these things uh, we are uh, sitting around maybe as of today about 74000 uh, uh, should say about infections about uh, then probably we might overtake china soon So, so actually, uh, in uh, in Wuhan, we have the uh, triage uh, policy in the emergency department. So, I just mentioned that we 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 have to run the nuclear test for all the patients. So, at least for two times. So, including the nuclear, uh, including the PCR test, including the serology test. I mean, at least for you know for the two times of negative. A result of the the nuclear test. So after two times, nuclear test, negative test, and then, okay, this patient will be clear uh, from the COVID nineteen. So and the, during this uh, process, we set up the translational zoom in the area, support this patient in the in this area, and we set up the you know all the PPE, all the all the you know all the policy. So we consider. This kind of patient as the potential COVID nineteen. So after we got the result, and then we will try age to the different to the different area for the patients. Uh, Dr. Peng, I fully agree with you because uh, 
luckily for us probably the huan province was the example for us already he had done the ground work for everybody on this planet so our job was only to follow or modify whatever we can add and all so before even it came to the india and all those things so most of the places already we had the covid hospitals or dedicated hospital or this thing the tried very clearly who is positive who is negative who suspect so it it was kept separate like you know, who who could be suspect and who could be positive who could be severely who went sometimes somebody might present like like in a, a sars kind of thing sari kind of thing they might just come like that so on that basis people were kept on segregating but it was kept on under, under observation because we were like getting info, new information from other countries also by then wuhan had slowed down and probably the other countries like italy germany france so they were in their thick of action and it was the presentation was slightly different we had the, some people coming from outside the country like our own like you know i should say our own countrymen who came from other places because they had gone a job or something that's fair enough nothing wrong about it but every patient who came and all those things water complaint they had the biggest problem sometimes what happens you know because of stigma some people did not tell they had this problem that's what i told in my lecture like about that one like you know with small pox this was not a problem because it was obvious on somebody's face the small pox person couldn't hide your his face but probably uh, i should say covid in a person he can be asymptomatic to carry for 14 days or 10 days whatever the small pox person no it was obvious on his face that's why we could say quarantine was quite quite successful in small pox and all but here in that comes to this particular asymptomatic now what do you do if 85% people asymptomatic people we could infect 85% they recover another 10% they might go to hospital they might recover on a 5% might go icu or a 20% might die so it's very pretty difficult this this is more high inf- highly infective so less less i should say about the uh, i should say like mortality point of view but uh, compared to what it was 100 years back 1918 where loss of life was different but now 100 days down the line we look, we look at every life is very valuable we can't afford to lose any life so that is the whole strategy what it changes but we are not still out of all this thing we are still understanding the pandemic as it goes it takes 2 to 3 years i told there may not be safe exit for any of us it could be messy affair and people might just come out on the street look let me accept whatever it is but even a vaccine oh, one more thing pang i just want you vaccine has to come it has to take at least one to one and a half year to complete whatever trial that might be required i i think so i think so i think so what about the medication any medication you think it made a difference for any of these patients pang so so actually i uh, from my experience i don't think so is any medication uh, useful uh, for the you know for this virus for the sars cov2 virus vaccine vaccine yeah vaccine probably but we need to wait it is the one 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 year so my take my take is it might take at least another 2 to 3 years is it yes yes or no but the uh, you know but the problem or all or all things to settle down yeah probably the you know the virus is always always mutated always changeable so it's the you you cannot guarantee you know the the vaccine you know uh, how long the vaccine will works for 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 the patients it's it's tough peg it's tough it's, it's not so easy i know i'm sitting as a, a critical care chief over there it's not that easy not easy for you not easy. so do you think the you know the hot weather can cure the virus on um, when actually weather by it has not made difference one thing uh, let me put it other way around as i am seeing it now or probably rather uh, like in the discussion and all like you know there are some countries who never had this quarantine you know about that one like mm. switzerland i think probably correct me if i'm wrong then in switzerland but uh, they opened and they allowed it to happen and all i think all the countries are following so called lockdown on the basis of at what time they can really handle the pandemic in a better way because they can they like ramp up the the health infrastructure and the people the beds and all on that basis we are, we are increasing the lockdown not just because we want to increase lockdown lockdown is is morbidity is the question but question is it what what every country is looking at it how best they can handle that particular one but switzerland is managing and some handful of islands in uh, pacific you know it much better than me uh, close to australia new zealand and uh, they don't have a single patient okay 
friend i have a different question for you so i have i have i have a question you are not over yeah yeah the about air conditioning what 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 do you think uh, air air conditioning so actually yeah. you, actually we turn off the air conditioning you know for the you know during the during the outbreak of the of the covid 19 so because this is the potential uh, resources uh, for the transmission yeah we uh, thank, thank one more one more thing i want to hear from you what about the scanning system mm -hmm. for the operating room scanning mm -hmm. you are unofficial i am exploiting completely mm -hmm. i am exploiting you you are unofficial as what about scanning from the ot can you central section or you want it to modify you mean for the you know, the in the in the in the or yeah absolutely don't okay, tell yeah. me i don't know you are unofficial as Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. 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 I'm. I'm. Yes. I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm at this order just. Yeah. 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 Now, what about the air conditioning? Do you want a negative pressure or a normal pressure? Yeah. I mean, the if the if the OR can equip it with the negative pressure, probably is okay. For you know, it's good for the you know for the for our medical professionals. So I I I, I actually I highly recommend. You know, you know, in in the we at least prepare one uh, room of the OR in the OR for the COVID for the COVID patients uh, with the negative pressure. No, 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 Peng. I have one one solid question for you. The question here is: We have we probably both of us working in some institutions. We are lucky. Say, I have made ten operating rooms. I can spare two operating rooms only for COVID work. In the small. Uh, unit which has got hardly one or two theaters. How do you guide them? What they should be doing it? Air conditioning and uh, scavenging. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I uh, I I cannot I cannot follow you. I'll I'll tell you again. <laughs> sir, uh, we are big uh, big hospitals. Yes, 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 yes. Because we yes. can spare two operation theaters for something. COVID nineteen. Only coordinated cases will be done there. So, so anyone? So, Doctor Peng. Yes. Uh, if I can intervene, Doctor yeah, Joshi is asking. Yeah. Yes. So, Doctor Joshi is asking yes. if uh, we are all in big institutions, like Doctor yes. Joshi is working in a big hospital. You are also a part of big hospital. Yes. Can we convert the whole hospital into a COVID nineteen setup? Mm, no. No. No, okay. because uh, we uh, we just uh, uh, open uh, one building or open two buildings for the COVID nineteen patients, so we need to keep other buildings for the long COVID patients. So and uh, uh, because in our hospital also we we uh, we uh, we just one of the biggest hospital in Wuhan, also uh, is the teaching hospital uh, from Wuhan University. So in the during the outbreak, we open uh, almost half of the facility, half of the buildings for the COVID nineteen patients. Also, we keep other half for long COVID patients. Where everything totally uh, totally separate uh, from the COVID and long COVID. So including all the you know including the you know the CT, including the you know the 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 lab the lab test, totally separate. But but we but we cannot uh, because we have to uh, serve for other uh, non-COVID patients even yes. uh, during the outbreak of the COVID nineteen. Yeah, especially for the emergency cases. That, that's that's great, right? Yeah, Dipesh, yeah, please go ahead, Dipesh. Mm -hmm. Right, sir. Uh, did I understand your question right, Doctor Joshi? No, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Have, okay. They are different model. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I believe we after this discussion we can again come back to similar discussion. Um, I have a few questions already ready for Dr. Peng and Dr. Joshi. Oh, great man! Now please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so first question I believe Dr. Peng, there is a lot of interest from Indian audience about China for obvious reasons, and same thing I believe from audience in China, we can also. see how dr joshi can take up about the matters which are there in india now so on similar lines i think the first question to dr peng is does the bcg vaccine 
have any protective qualities against covid 19 so uh, actually i uh, uh, i heard that story uh, because i i i heard you know the you know the different population uh, infected in in the states the you know the told the told us so some asian uh, population especially you know the the, the chinese immigrant so actually the instance of the covid-19 in in the states you know from the chinese immigrant actually quite lower because they the calculate uh, probably you know the you know this chinese uh, immigrant they they have the you know the vaccine you know you know when they were in in china so i think probably the Uh, this will be this will uh, uh, boost uh, the immune uh, function you know to uh, to uh, uh, you know to, uh, against the you know for the covid-19 but we have no any uh, strong evidence to show this relationship because uh, in china everybody uh, you know have have this vaccine already but uh, we we have we, we cannot compare but in the states actually the, they do have the the data you know the tell us the you know the chinese immigrants probably the you know, instance is quite low because they have such a they have such the uh, vaccine before probably uh, i i i cannot i cannot show this is the uh, relationship or this is the any uh, other uh, just the uh, just just the, i because we have no solid evidence to explain that okay i understood i think it's a us thought that probably bcg is helpful but we do not have scientific evidence to prove am i right, right, right dr right, peng right, right. yes okay so next question is to our dr joshi uh, so sir when should we start the elective surgeries now in india the situation you know so elective oh, surgeries yeah, Yeah, sorry. Fine, you think? No, sir. You, you can continue. Yeah, Doctor Peng, you if, if you want to add anything. Yeah, yeah. You mean the uh, when should we uh, uh, resume the elective cases, right? Right, right. I'm asking this to Doctor Joshi for India, when the elective surgeries can start. Yeah. So actually, uh, in uh, in Wuhan, uh, we started the elective cases uh, just in the early. uh april uh because the during that time the, you know almost the zero new cases uh for uh, you know for almost uh, two weeks and then you know the the hospital authority so determined to resume the elective cases during that time uh, of, but this is a very uh, uh difficult uh, stage difficult time so we need to prepare for all uh you know you know to to reopen the uh, elective cases so first uh, we need to clean everything to prepare the environment also we do uh, we we have, we set up the the policy the protocol you know just i just we mentioned how to uh, try age uh, the patients uh, based on the results you know based on the you know pcr results based on the serology results because this is quite important Uh, we when we determine to uh, open the elective cases we need to uh, we probably we need to uh, do the do the best job for the trial age uh, for the potential uh, covid 19 patients yeah thanks uh, dipesh sir i think you can also continue yes yeah thanks yeah, th- thanks for paying actually what i can understand uh, what i know about that also like you know I think uh, Wuhan was under lockdown for seventy-six days. Am I right? Yes, yes. That is that you finished on April sixth or eighth. Yes, well, yes. We right? almost uh, we almost uh, resumed. Okay, first week you said April sixth or eighth you finished. I remember. Yeah. Then you start the electives. Yeah, we yeah we we re- resume the elective cases for almost the one month. So actually, actually, what is being actually suggested by the different polls, I should say, the the societies across the globe is, uh, what is at least a fourteen days should be there, where there is a dip in the number of the uh, like you know the incidence of the patients or the death. 
what did you say like number of cases or deaths and all should, should plummet continuously for 14 days that means you are going down probably and all those things they put the pandemic is slowing down and that is the time they say you can go for the elective one but again the, there is a, one more thing is a lot depends on on your authorities authorities because sometimes you lock down as long as you are on lockdown things are fine the moment you open it up again it opens up so the having said that but does it mean that you can do have me locked down for 6 months or say one year two years it won't work like that i think electives best thing is what best suggested uh, technical and medical point of what we can suggest is 14 days continuously if the numbers are going down death or the uh, new infections that's the time to start the elective work dr peng anything you want to add yeah so so actually uh, why we choose the you know the early you know the early uh, apollo for the for the day to reopen for the elective cases because uh, during the that day almost two weeks no any new cases so so this is the you know the government the hospital authority uh, to have the discussion with the expert and to determine okay that time uh, we open the uh, elective cases uh, probably is the relative safe for all for you know for the patients as well as for the medical workers and also of so course I, we need I, to prepare you know for the for the uh, we open uh, the new uh, we open uh, the elective cases we, we we need to prepare we need to Uh, the policy we 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 set up the protocol, you know, because we need to uh, we need to do all the screening tests for the patients. Yeah, Dr. Peng, I, I really noted your thoughts and all those things. As probably I think probably what uh, we are watching, like in the AC recommendation across the the locally, I think the best authority will be the local authorities. They know how many kits because. It's not only about the fourteen days of uh, the country dipping and all. You have to know how many ICU beds you have got. You have to know how much is the manpower. You have to know how much how many PPE kits you have. Can you take care of all those things? And in case if you require the COVID testing and all, are you equipped for all those things? Then you need to have the priority that you want to go for the transplant patients, or you want to go for the uh, like cardiac surgical patients or oncology patients. There are so many factors which are involved, but one simple thing guideline is like if resources are optimum, then you can go for the elective work. The, big, the reason being why you can go elective work, but later date only reason being the outcome has been for people who are COVID positive as of now, as of now. But things might change because as I told in my lecture, fourteen thousand papers have come in last four months. Even one one per six in one paper per day is going to take fourteen hundred days. Let me correct myself. Three sixty-five days in a year, so that almost comes to a. So you can imagine how much of time he is going to take to take, uh, take like three sixty-five uh, days in a year. If you fourteen thousand papers, so much of information. Safe is better. Uh, government and available resources. If you are comfortable, you want to start. Make sure the COVID testing is available. And if you don't COVID testing enough and all those things, have enough PPE kits. Test kits are available. Get it uh, done. And then if if it's positive. Let them go through cycle of recovering, going through all the quarantine and all those things. Then you can consider for the procedure. Yes, sir, did you answer your question? Yes, sir. I understood. Like, if the yeah. resources are there, as per Doctor Peng and Doctor Joshi, yeah, then we can start the electives and probably after a time of fourteen days under observation. Yeah, if yeah, the government yeah. decides so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything is okay. Yeah, you know, resources okay. Yeah, should be. Yeah, you know, yeah. Make sure you know the you know the patients is safe. Make sure right. the the medical workers enough. Uh, they have enough uh, energy to take all the Correct. patients. Correct. Okay. So next question to Doctor Peng. Uh, Doctor Peng, how about the reinfections which have happened to the patients who got infection first time, and then probably the reinfections happened. What are the effects of antibodies, and what is the duration after which this reinfection usually happened? 
So uh, first, uh, we need to uh, define uh, what's, uh, what's the definition of the reinfection. So if the if the patients uh, only have have only like the one or two times of negative uh, PCR, and then have the uh, one more positive uh, one more positive uh, PCR, so we don't think this patient is the reinfection. So because the probably the the one uh, negative uh, PCR probably is the false PCR results, not the true PCR. So if the patients have the uh, at least the five times uh, negative PCR uh, for a long time, for example, for almost uh, one uh, one month, yeah. and then when the case the patient came to the hospital again, and then they do the test uh, with the uh, positive PCR, and then we consider that patient probably is the reinfection. So this is the 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 different uh, definition, very important, and also. How we uh, manage uh, the patient with the reinfection? So um, uh, just to follow up the patient, you know, most of the patients with the reinfection, of course, the, the instance of the uh, infection is quite low. Uh, I cannot say uh, how much the, but uh, from our uh, hospital uh, uh, data, probably is around. Uh, uh, Around uh, two percent of the patients, uh, you know, uh, probably have the reinfection. Uh, so, and the most, and also we follow up this kind of patients as the almost the, almost the, all the patients, just the mild or just mild symptoms or or uh, or asymptomatic. So. We just follow up the patients. I just follow up the patients. Uh, you know, every two weeks or 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 every one month for the nuclear test to see how the patients, the, uh, the nuclear test uh, changes or any uh, serology test or any antibody uh, occurred. So just the follow up of the patients. And from, uh, from all the, from the, uh, uh, the data from all hospital. And uh, I think it's the, some of the patients with the reinfection gradually uh, you know, they become elective, right? Uh, become elective again, so uh, without any treatment. Okay, okay. So, next question is to Dr. Joshi. Uh, sir, in India, yeah, what are the new social and emotional problems for healthcare workers, especially in these tough times? Uh, not just, uh, I think, India, it's, it's, it's across the globe. I think Pangir also will uh, agree with me. See, the question here is, just imagine a healthcare worker goes to a hospital. Uh, just imagine, like, they're probably slightly more knowledgeable, definitely, than compared to the common um, civilization. You log on, you go to the work and all. Now, you don't know whatever the gloves you're wearing or probably what a mask you're wearing. It's the complete seal or not, you don't know. Because... Uh, I think Peng will agree with me in Wuhan itself. Peng, am I right? If you correct me if I'm wrong, almost close to 2,000 people we lost health workers at uh, Wuhan province. 2,000 health workers we lost because uh, we didn't have, uh, like, you know, the safety precautions and all, like, they did not follow, or there was some lack or war work. A lot of them, they made a lot of efforts at Wuhan. I mean, that, that was the, I should say, like, you know, the incubator for everything. Almost 2,000 people lost their life because they wanted to help the patient, save the patient. In the process, they got infected and they lost the healthcare personnel. Same thing applies here because, you know, you got, you come to the workplace and uh, you wear the whatever, the doffing or whatever, whatever donning you want to do, whatever the mask, whatever the hand wash. At the end of the day, you don't know, have enough hand washing properly. Unknowingly, I have touched my mask and I don't know I have touched my phone. I mean, I go back home, uh, maybe I won't hug my children and probably the children uh, might get infected, my family might get infected. And, and uh, this is human. I don't say like, you know, see, people have worked in probably kind of war, epidemic kind of situation. War, war is different thing. Like, you know, understand like in a person, world, war, war between two countries and all the same people uh, die because of the hemorrhage or maybe fractures, a lot of these things. The infection something, at the end of the day, if the person has to go back home, his worry is, am I carrying infection back to the 
home one at at here workplace also they don't know and second thing is how we as hospital or healthcare profession we treat a healthcare worker who got affected with the covid like an if if i get a covid 19 infection today say for example how will my hospital take it will we take it like you know this is occupation hazard he has taken it will they take care of me or say no 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 this this this, this is not proper care and all those things that's why got support the fear is there because across the globe the fear is the loss of job a loss of esteem and loss of family life and and, and it, it is not it's it's human nothing wrong, wrong about it nothing wrong, wrong about it we have to address this thing and keep on talking to this people it's not question of doffing and donning it's always question of what we call it like you know talking to them like tender loving care like talk to them say hello to them and it's nothing wrong like you're not going to die or nothing like that it's just infection it comes and goes this reassurance almost will at repeat on day to day basis that's the only way we can motivate our healthcare person who are working with us kya dip tesh okay understood sir uh one question to dr peng so any comments on the role of supportive treatment in icu like crrt cytokine removal pharmacotherapy what are the, what is the role of supportive treatment in icu uh i mean uh, uh for the crt so actually the the instance of the aki uh, from covid 19 uh, is variable based on the different uh, region so actually in wuhan uh you know the total uh, instance of the aki uh, from the hospital around the less than 10% but for the for the icu the aki distance is around 20% so uh, about a, a half of the patients with the aki uh, requiring the renal replacement therapy so i i do think that kind of therapy uh, we are works uh, for the patients with covid-19 uh and also regarding the cytokine removal so so this is the based on the uh, theory of the cytokine storm so if the patients have the uh, rapid uh, changes of the uh, people ratio such as the you know rapid uh, uh, deterioration uh, of the oxygenation in uh, also the patient with the Uh, complicated with the uh, shock or complicated with the uh, multiple organ failure and also uh, we have a lot of the uh, diagnostic uh, uh, approach to detect if the patient have the cytokine storm or not so if the patient have the cytokine storm the patient usually have the elevated uh, uh, ferritin uh, the patient have uh, elevated the uh, Uh, uh IL6 level or CRP level and uh, so in this situation we may have some uh, approach uh, to remove the cytokine so uh, one uh, approach which is called hemoabsorption or hemoperfusion uh, uh, which is the uh, using a, a, a you know a column Uh, which containing uh, containing the absorptive materials uh, to remove the cytokines so uh, we use the you know such such a uh, chrome uh, you know from the uh, company from the europe or company from china and also we have we run some study so it it do uh, reduce the cytokine levels also to improve the organ function so this is the one uh, approach uh, for the cytokine uh, storm also uh, we use the monoclonal antibody uh, to control the cytokine storm but uh, from the data so probably we haven't see any uh, improvement uh, regarding the monoclonal antibody for the cytokine storm also we can use the uh, corticosteroids uh for the cytokine storm uh but also we have run some uh, study for, for this kind of approach uh, uh, it may 
it also it works uh, for the cytokine storm using the corticosteroids. So this is the uh, our uh, approach, uh, you know, for the different uh, uh, supports uh, for, for the patient in the ICU. So, Dr. Peng, my next question to you is, uh, according to a recent UK report, it is suspected that there is some connection between COVID-19 and an unusual inflammatory syndrome in children in China. Any thoughts on that? So, uh, so actually, uh, we, uh, this kind of cases are, are, are rare. I know the, most of the uh, pediatric cases, you know, they have the complicated, I mean, not only for the pediatric cases, but also for the adult cases or uh, complicated with the uh, embolism, the vascular embolism. So, uh, you know, for the, you know, for some pediatric cases, they, you know, they have the uh, pediatric, they have the embolism, you know, in the, in the big vessels, and probably the way I induce the sudden death uh, for the for the kids, so this is the big issue. And uh, so, because the for COVID nineteen, the the hypercoagulation state uh, status is, is quite often in all the patients. So we routinely using the uh, prophylactic uh, heparin uh, for our patients. And if the patients have the high risk of the coagulation, uh, uh, such as the, you know, the, the diameter is quite high, and the patients have the, have the DVT, and probably we use the therapeutic uh, dose of the heparin for the patients. So, I mean, the, this is the uh, vascular embolism quite often in the patients. So you, you mentioned that for the kids, I uh, I love this kind of uh, problem is the uh, I I heard this this story uh, happened uh, probably happened more uh, in the states happened more in the you know in the western countries you know but in China because uh, this kind of situation probably not so often you know but but we do have such as the. Uh, vascular embolism uh, problem in all patients, in in, uh, in all ages of patients, not only for the kids, but also for the adults. Okay. So, sir, next question to Dr. Peng is, uh, do you think the serum ferritin levels in COVID-19 patient is an early clue for COVID-19 infection? Uh, I don't think it's the it's only clue. Because the you know uh, you know the PCR the you know the you know for the nuclear test the PCR positive is the one of the clue for the for the COVID nineteen so of course if the patient have the uh, positive uh, IgM or positive IgG which also indicated that this patient the patient uh, in, uh, infected the the patient the COVID COVID nineteen already. So, so they have they have the curve the the curve you know based on the time course, or of the you know the PCR when the PCR occur, uh, when the IgM occur, when the IgG occur. Usually, the PCR uh, occur occurred earlier, and then the IgM, and then the IgG. Yeah. Okay. Uh Next question is, in big setups, hospitals can dedicate operating rooms for COVID-19 patients. But what about small hospitals? They have very limited operating rooms. How can they dedicate those resources for COVID-19? This is the, this is the big challenge for, you know, for the medical uh, workers in the small hospital. So, I mean, uh, depends. So if, if, if uh, it was the uh, age, it was the outbreak uh, time, probably just uh, 
uh, shut down all the routine cases uh, only for the only for the COVID cases. So, I mean, if uh, it was the you know just like uh, our situation in Wuhan, as you know, probably the small hospital only focus for the non-COVID patients, but they they need to run all the uh, screening tests for the patients. Okay. Next question is, how is the condition in Wuhan and Hubei province now? Because in news, people are seeing that there is some sort of reinfection. Also, there is some positive news that many people have been treated. So from your view, how is the situation exactly in Wuhan and what can be the future situation? So actually, now the situation in Wuhan is the I think it's the is almost the back to the normal uh, because all the you know uh, you know the hotels, uh, restaurant uh, reopened already, and uh, and just uh, yesterday we have some new cases, just uh, six new cases. I, I I think it's the you know the the the, case, the new case. Less than ten, it's it's a uh, it's normal, you know, for the you know for the Wuhan, which is a, a huge population. But if the if the if the new cases is around um, you know more than one hundred, and then I will suspect that probably we need to uh, con reconsider the you know do we have something to you know uh, can improve this situation better. But if the new cases less than ten, I think it's normal. But we, but actually, we have very strict uh, uh, policy uh, to quarantine all the uh, uh, all uh, all the you know the citizens in Wuhan. You know, uh, we have very strict policy. You know, in the public uh, places, you know, every every public places, they we need to have the you know the temperature check. We just we have to show the green card. You know, the, the, we can we have to sell the, the health card. Uh, you know, for the you know to to if we want to go anywhere, we sh we should we have to sell the health card, which is containing the information. Uh, how is the our re uh, recent uh, uh, nuclear test? How is our recent serology uh, test? So if you have the uh, health card, you are allowed to go anywhere. You. I mean, uh, so and even in the public uh, uh, places, they have uh, everybody have to to have the temperature check. So all this uh, policy make sure uh, uh, we we uh, we need to we have we have to control the new uh, outbreak of the patients. So actually, in the Wuhan has reopened already for one month. So I, I don't think it's a, we have the second wave of the outbreak. Okay, so next question is, as an ICU intensivist, what do you think of the current situation now? Is it early intubation or delayed intubation with oxygen therapy, which is better? Early intubation versus delayed intubation with O2 therapy. So I mean, it depends. It's the uh, whether or not uh, we we will uh, perform intubation for the patients. We need to. Uh, I just mentioned that we need to to run the screen test uh, for the patient. So if the patient is the is long COVID patients, and then we just uh, uh, follow the. Uh, a protocol for the lung COVID patients. So if the patient is, is okay, and then we can uh, whether or not if the patients uh, suitable for intervention, and we have to intubate for the patients. So uh, so we cannot delay the, the intervention for the patients. But of course, we need to uh, prepare the the minimum uh, protection. I mean the N95. Uh, mask is the minimum uh, protection uh, for our medical professionals. So 
uh, so if you want to perform the uh, intubation, also you, you need to wear the the goggle as well as the you know probably the eye shirt uh, during the procedures to uh, prevent the potential uh, infection. Even the patient uh, is diagnosed as lung COVID. Okay. Next question is around ECMO. So how exactly ECMO helps for patients who are positive with COVID-19? So uh, from our experience, uh, ECMO, you know, the mortality uh, from the ECMO treatment for the COVID-19 is around uh, uh, 50%. So almost uh, similar to the patients uh, with the severe pneumonia, with the other uh, virus pneumonia uh, from other etiologists. So, I mean, the main point is that we need to uh, uh, start, we need to initiate ECMO uh, a little bit earlier. So if the patients have the uh, severe uh, hypoxemia and also uh, uh, complicated with the uh, carbon dioxide mutation, so we need to initiate the, the ECMO uh, for the uh, for the COVID patients. So uh, I don't think it's any differences uh, from the ECMO treatment, uh, you know, from uh, from other, you know, lung COVID patients. Okay, some people feel there is a comment from some doctors that propofol needs to be used very less for COVID-19 patients. What is your thought on this, Dr. Peng? So propofol also, uh, uh, even you know, for the intubation, uh, we should be careful because I just mentioned, I just, from my talk, uh, propofol will uh, worsen the hypotension uh, because the, during the uh, intubation, most of the patients are complicated with the hypotension. So we need to minimize use of the propofol uh, for the patients. And also uh, for the uh, patients, uh, you know, for the sedation, uh, also, we use, especially for the patients have the uh, using the um, you know the the nutrition the lung you know the PN nutrition, and also we need to uh, also we need to take uh, the consider the you know the proper for we are uh, increase the you know the fat uh, contents. Okay. Uh, sir, one question from non-COVID patients. In Wuhan, during the peak, definitely it would have been the COVID cases which were getting treated. But was there also a possibility that non-COVID cases also came in your ICU or in your hospital? Yeah, of, of course. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, during the out outbreak, we have uh, uh, you know the different building uh, uh, for the COVID and lung COVID patients. So even you know we have the ICU. Uh, each building have the uh, have their own ICUs. So uh, yeah, we we definitely we need to uh, try age the patients in the you know COVID patients in the in this building, lung COVID in, in another building. Okay, so Dr. Peng, I believe it's quite late as you informed me. Uh, if you have any questions to Dr. Joshi now, you can ask and then we will continue the session with Dr. Joshi for our Indian audience. It is not very late now, but I believe in China, yeah. as you texted me, it is getting a bit extended, right? Okay. So Dr. Joshi, please unmute your line, sir. Uh, we will have some concluding discussions between Dr. Peng and Dr. Joshi now, and then we will request Dr. Peng's for his kind advice further. Yeah, it's nice talking to you on Delegum. 
I would love this. Probably this we could end it. Uh, like we come to consider this session for some more longer time, but in a time frame is something and all. But you know, we are learning from your experience. But um, we hope you know you don't have this experience again and again. You know, it is the last one. At least within our generation, the next generation plan the way they it want to do. And uh, any poly you want, a clinical pulse you want to share with us, like do's and don'ts. We always welcome you. Please uh, share with us so that you know. uh we don't uh, do that mistake and then try to learn rather we learn from your experience